There is a really great maternal fetal triage index that A1 has created mostly for use in obstetrics triaging patients and priorities, but I think there's a lot of key points that are really helpful for EMS providers in out of hospital setting to help prioritize. Do you go to the closest hospital that has um, ER access, labor and delivery access? Do you need to go somewhere that's the highest priority for the baby um, based on the fetal complications and driving the extra 20 minutes will make a big difference. So there's a lot with EMS when minutes matter and trying to determine prioritization. You have two patients combined when she's pregnant and then postpartum you have two separate patients to assess and take care of. So this is a really great presentation I found from Catherine Rule. Um, it was from 2018 and I took bits and pieces specific to EMS and how it can really help to prioritize um, how fast you need to drive, is it better to deliver at home, is it better to go to the local community hospital minutes away or to go to a higher level acuity facility. So when you're assessing a mom, possibly a fetus inside of her or postpartum, you have a newborn or a brand new delivered mother, there's common things you need to look at for triage assessment elements. You want to know what is the chief complaint, whether it's being reported by the mom, the partner, when they call 911, if it's reported by the midwife requesting additional assistance. What is the chief complaint? Why are you being sent to the home, the birth center, wherever location that needs to be transported to the hospital? Um, what are the vital signs for the mom and the baby? It depends on if this is prenatally versus is postpartum. Um, a nice reassuring sign prenatally, asking the mom a basic question, how has the baby's movement been doing? Wiggly babies are happy babies, even though you're not doing Doppler monitoring external assessment of the baby's heart rate during labor. If you can see on her belly the baby is wiggling, you can put your hand on the belly, the baby is wiggling, you know the baby is getting good oxygenation. So those are very simple assessment things. Um, contractions, leaking of fluid, vaginal bleeding, these are all really important things um, are her contractions 10 minutes apart two minutes apart are they mild to palpation when you press on her belly or are they stronger contractions how is she acting during them where is she feeling the pressure when there's fluid leaking, it's really important to know what the amniotic fluid is. It clear? Is it meconium stained? Is there a blood tinge to it? Um, if it's meconium stained, especially if it's thicker meconium, assume that the baby had some stress. You don't know if it's during labor. You don't know if it was two days ago, but something caused that anal sphincter to relax, and that's where the baby had a bowel movement. It's you're more likely to see meconium in more post-term babies. So if her gestational age is 42 weeks, you're much more likely to see the meconium than 38 weeks gestation. Um, bleeding is really important. There's two types of bleeding. There's the normal bloody show bleeding. That's just good progress, cervical dilation. It's more mucousy. It's more blood tinged. It can be quite a bit. Um, the bleeding we get concerned about is the period-like bleeding, the bright red, the dark old blood, but it's it's more of a period like flow. You start thinking about the placenta or where is the underlining location that's causing this bleeding. How is she rating her pain? Is her contraction her main concern or is she having chest pain? Like what is her primary pain? Where is she, how is she describing it? What is it rated? Um, that is really important information. Um, if she's having a lot of vaginal pain, a lot of rectal pressure and pain, um, you always wonder about the baby being closer to delivering versus she describes it more in her tummy, her upper abdomen, her right upper quadrant. Um, right upper quadrant and headaches, you always worry about preeclampsia, definitely checking her blood pressure. Um, how is she coping with labor? Is she doing her thing? She's very internal when she has a contraction and it's hard for her to respond or is she writhing out of control, going all over the place, you can't have a conversation with her, she's just really having a hard time adjusting to her labor. What's her mental status? Is she alert? Is she easy to respond? Is she exhausted? She's been up for three days. Is she dehydrated? Is she sick where you can't? She's unconscious. She's not responding. Um, those are really important things to assess. Um, her pregnancy history, what baby is it for her? Is it her first baby, second, 10th baby? 
how did her other pregnancies go? Um, does she have any complications with this one? Uh, if they've been watching certain lab work, does she have diabetes? Does she have hypertension? Um, is there one baby? Is there two babies in there? Did she have an anatomy scan so we can be confident the placenta is not near the cervix? Like just these are some of the things you may not be able to ask the patient in the moment a lot of those details, but if there's a midwife there, that's a great, great questions for history and getting clear communication to pass on and for you to make clinical decisions decision making. Past OB history, has she had C-sections before? Is this baby um, breech? Is, is she had um, vaginal deliveries? Has she gone term or is she always went preterm and now she's 30 weeks gestation? So there's a high probability she's in preterm labor. So it's really important to know her history on top of the past and what's going on now. Has she had uterine surgery? Um, is she normal body mass index? Is she obese? Um, has she had three shoulder dystocias and she's close to delivering? You have a high probability that you need to anticipate a shoulder dystocia. What meds is she currently on? Is she taking something for Synthroid? Is she taking diabetes medicines? Is she on insulin and she took too much or she hasn't taken her, she hasn't been monitoring her blood sugar as well and her blood sugar is really high and she's in ketoacidosis. There's so many things that are important and sometimes you have the luxury of time to ask lots of questions and sometimes you don't. Um, allergies, you always want to know a patient's allergies. You want to make sure you're not giving anything that's going to cause more harm. Um, so that's just a simple question to ask. The luxury is a lot of our pregnant ladies are pretty normal and healthy overall so they shouldn't be have um, any too many medications and too many allergies to worry about. Her social history, um, has she has a history of intimate partner violence, a history of a good support network, who's with her right now, who's going to be going with her to the EMS transport, um, who can help with her other kids at home if all of a sudden you're called at two in the morning and um, you just need to know the dynamics. Is she in a safe home? Is there certain conversations you can have? Is there things after the critical assessment is done um, we need to address with a social worker once she gets to the hospital? So it's important to standardize triage. As you're an EMS provider, you realize you can come to a house, a facility, transport for practically anything. So you really wanna standardize your triage questions and prioritize what is the highest priority, do some quick assessments, objectively, subjectively, and really have a good sense of that, um, do we need to rush really quickly? Minutes do matter in this situation. Or, you know, we all just need to take a breath. She, this is normal, healthy pregnancy. She's delivering very quickly. Let's have a baby. There's nothing besides just an imminent baby coming into the world. And there's just high levels of priority of what you can be exposed to. And you want to be confident that you're assessing this is a normal variation, precipitate delivery, she's going fast, or this is a prolapse cord, this is a complication of preeclampsia and she's starting to have seizures and now she's going into eclampsia. There's so many important things as EMS providers and talking to your ER um, doctor and following your protocols. So consistency in standardization will decrease the errors, improve the outcomes, um, especially without a hospital midwives and transports. You don't want breakdown of communication. You don't want tension among you, the midwife, the family. There's, there's a reason they delivered at home. There's a reason they're already hesitant with the medical system. And so we want to respect everyone and we want to just take care of them safely. So triage and liability, this is more in obstetrics triaging, but I think it's really helpful just for EMS to understand what are the highest things that get sued for? What are the highest things that are risk for you, for your care management, missed things? Um, it's, it's really shocking in obstetrics because there's a life of two people, that baby, and it's a high litigation aspect. So as EMS providers, you really want to do a good job of reducing the risk of exposure to litigation. So a lot of the allegations are just not transporting, particularly in obstetrics, if it's a community hospital, they're not transporting fast enough to a higher acuity. So part of EMS, I think it's really important for you to determine, do I go to the local community hospital or do I get in my protocol, have a conversation? Can we go to a higher acuity facility that has NICU access versus we have to aeromed and the community hospital doesn't have those things? You have to make that risk um, benefit decision making. I know with my private practice, I was very adamant. I was a certified nurse midwife. I had an office clinic. We had a woman come in for a problem prenatal visit, 18 weeks 
gestation, she was pretty high risk, relatively speaking, for out of hospital birth. She had multiple uh, miscarriages. Um, she was so excited about finally being pregnant. She had some green discharge, and when I did her vaginal speculum exam, her cervix was already dilated. There was a bulging bag. I could see the baby's foot 18 weeks along. This is a medical emergency. And so we live in a little community facility. I put her in one of the OB beds. We put her in high foul, or we put her where her butt was a little more in the air with a pillow. She wasn't having contractions. I was trying to be very calm of what was going on. We called 911. EMS came and EMS was very adamant to take her to the local community hospital that's three blocks away. And because of my skill set and because of my advocacy and reinforcing to the patient, I had them override their usual protocol so that they could drive very quickly to the next acuity. She needed an emergency saclage. The, the community hospital was not going to be able to help her do anything. It was going to be wasting valuable, precious time to try to save her baby. So by that communication and that respect for each other and understanding what's the highest acuity, we got her to a hospital facility that had NICU services and could do much more quickly the high risk things she needed versus what the local hospital three blocks away could do. So areas of risk, you just want the timeliness. You want good clinical assessment skills. You want to ask a lot, a lot of great questions to the midwife, to the family. Um, understand your protocols really well inside and out of, and being confident, pregnant women across the board, it doesn't matter if you're in EMS or the hospital si system. We, the big joke is when I worked labor and delivery, you would have ER nurses running faster in a wheelchair with a pregnant woman about ready to deliver than they would with someone to a heart attack. Like it's, it's when you're not comfortable and you're not around it, it tends to cause anxiety and tension. So the intent, the purpose of this course is to give you confidence that birth is a normal process. 80% of women are low risk healthy. How can we assess and be confident and categorize her? This is a normal low risk delivery that's just happening faster than they can get to the hospital or this was a planned home birth and the midwife is needing she's transitioned from low risk to high risk and what is going on exactly to need your amazing services so this is a great algorithm that's more used in inpatient OB triage, but I think it's helpful for EMS services to kind of have a priority of one through five. This is low priority. This is high priority. Um, what facilities we transfer to? Are we thinking more about the mom? Are we thinking more about the baby? So these are great questions. You can Google search and pull up this maternal fetal triage index just to review the algorithm of questions and minutes matter and, and what should be done for those so a stat, a priority one, which is kind of easy because we call it a priority one makes you urgency, a birth is imminent, there's something life-threatening, minutes matter, you really need to be on your toes and quickly getting to the closest facility as soon as possible. Um, an, an urgent is priority two. You know, it's pretty serious, but it's not minutes matter. We need to definitely get her taken care of, but it's not as high of an urgent situation. And these are kind of just the examples of what could be happening. She has pre-existing medical conditions. She's having trouble breathing. The baby's having trouble be breathing, but it's not a full-on resuscitation yet. Um, she is having decreased fetal movement. Well, that's definitely a concern. We want to do a non-stress test, but minutes don't matter at this point. You don't need to be doing a full-on transfer as quickly as possible. Priority three is more of a prompt. You want to... It's kind of that average urgency, you know, you've got a little more time. There's there's definitely something going on. I'm glad that EMS was called. Um, we want to definitely get her taken care of. A non-urgent makes me think more of, you know, she has a complaint. She has a concern. It probably could have been taken care of the next couple days with an office. Or this is something that we can have a little more time to ask. Is she's having discomforts around ligament pain? There's some discharge going on. She's constipated. She hasn't pooped in a few days. Like... These are concerning things. You want to make sure you're ruling out more serious underlying conditions, but they sound more like common discomforts of pregnancy that maybe it's her first baby and she just doesn't know. She hasn't had much prenatal care. She's young. She's anxious. She Google searched too much. Like it could be a many different things. This one, priority five, I think of more very basic. These are more if there's lack of social support. She doesn't have access to transportation and she wants to be seen. This, You are her ride to her office. 
office visit. You are her ride to the OB triage unit to get checked out because she doesn't have a way to transport herself. And there may not be anything really serious right at this point. You are becoming her um, medical t taxi services. So just kind of think of those priorities of when you're getting called, what are you getting called about? So the reason that having a more standardized algorithm in this maternal fetal triage index is just to help you prioritize and be confident that, holy crap, minutes do matter. This is very serious. We have a prolapse cord. We have significant vaginal bleeding. We have um, a mom that's unconscious. She's seizing. We have a baby that just delivered that's not breathing. Those are very, very serious things versus the extreme that she calls you. She thinks her water broke. She just got out of the bathtub. She just had sex. She just just, she has urinary incontinence and she has no transport to the hospital to get checked out more. So there's 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 extremes you're going to be called for and I wanted everyone to feel confident that there is algorithms. There are simple questions you can ask to really feel comfortable. How fast do we need to drive and what facility makes the most sense to take the mom and baby to?